Hi, my name is Alan Prost and I'm doing a short series of videotapes on how to do pumping function testing. So this is the part, first part where we would interview the patient and uh, we're going to start off with a slow vital capacity test. But before we do that, we need to get a little bit of information about our patient. We need to know, of course, their height and their weight and their name and make sure they've got their age correctly documented because we want to compare predicted values to their normal values, all right, to their values that we're going to actually test on. So uh, we need to know why we're doing the PFT. That's important to get from our client or our patient. So uh, it might be because they have uh, some symptoms that we should be aware of. Uh, we want to get a good idea of their medical history and there's some specific questions that we need to ask um, before we do a PFT test. Um, those are guided by the American Thoracic Society guidelines. We need to know about their smoking history. All right, so we've got to check that off, make sure we find out if they've got a smoking history if they've had any recent changes in their cough for their sputum production, and that might tie into why we're actually doing the PFT. So this background information is important to the interpretation. Um, we want to know about if they've had any unusual symptoms like such as shortness of breath that we should be aware of, or a recent heart condition. If they're insinuating that this is because of a, a pre and post asthma assessment, or they're telling us that, then maybe we should auscultate their chest Often we do a blood gas to get some other background information on them. And we might auscultate to determine if they're wheezy at this time and see if that clears when we give them bronchodilators. All right. So if they've got a known condition such as COPD or um, they're feeling short of breath or they've got a history of being exposed to certain allergens or toxic substances, we want to keep an eye on that. And one of the big things we want to do is uh, note if they've had a myocardial infarction and we shouldn't do any PFT testing according to the American Thoracic Society guidelines, if it's been uh, within one month. So we shouldn't do a test if it's been within one month. Some other possible contraindications are if they're presently complaining of chest pains or they've got some discomfort um, in preventing them from doing a test. Um, it could be any recent surgeries that they may have had, such as abdominal surgery or anything that's going to prevent them from being able to give us a full forced vital capacity or be able to breathe hard for us. And, if it's particularly if it's been within the last six weeks, we want to be aware of that. If they've got any facial um, sores or cuts or bruises or something that would prevent them from being able to participate in doing the testing today, we need to be aware of that. If we've got any lesions or any contagious diseases. Another little more delicate topic is about whether or not they might have problems with going to the bathroom because we are going to be physically testing the patients and putting them under a little bit of physical stress, so that might cause them to need to go to the bathroom. So I always start off with asking if they need to go to the washroom now, and that with the testing, um, they may feel the need to, uh, to go to the washroom, or if they have problems in that area, that this kind of testing may bring on um, urination or defecation problems. So we might, have a, might deal with that in a, in a nice way. Just by asking these questions, we can get an idea if the patient is capable of listening to our instructions and doing the test today. And that's part of what I'm going to talk to you about is how to set up for that and give them good instruction. All right. So there are specific activities that should be avoided prior to doing a PFT, such as smoking within one hour, um, should not have consumed any alcohol within four hours. You should have loose um, fitting clothing so that it's comfortable to do the, the testing that we're going to do and these things should be outlined to the patient prior to coming to do, getting the test done. All right. Um, if they've had a large meal they should probably not have the test done within two hours because that would may prevent them from having a good abdominal excursion and being able to contribute to the test and vigorously. All right. Another thing we're looking for is what medications are they presently on so we want a good clear accurate description of any medications that they're receiving, the dosages that they're taking, particularly if it's um, for breathing, such as bronchodilators or short-term or long-term bronchodilator therapies. And if they are, if we're doing a pre and post, we should be making sure that they haven't taken any of those drugs for at least four hours. All right? So that's important and should be outlined before the patient even comes here. All right? Well, one of the first tests we're going to do today is we're going to do a slow vital capacity. And that's often one of the first tests that we would recommend that you do for the patients.
got a good history, they understand why they're going to do it. And now a key thing about pulmonary function testing is making sure we coach effectively to get good results. So for the slow vital capacity, you want to make sure the patient's aware that they're going to be using a filter. That's what we use in our labs. Every lab's a little bit differently. And that they utilize this filter in the proper way. So all the air has got to go in and out through this filter, and it's going to be hooked up to a device here that's going to measure the flow rates and volumes. Right. Later on, we'll talk to them about some of the gases and stuff that they'll be in, 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 inhaling. But for this test, make sure that they understand how to do the test. So it's important to get a good CO. So we're going to put on our nose clips, and they'll be wearing their nose clips for the test. And we want to get our teeth on the outside of this filter and get a good seal around that with their lips. Now, if they're having problems doing that for some reason, you can use other kind of mouthpieces that may help a little bit with that. But it's really important that they understand not to block the airway with the tongue. So don't block it with your tongue. Keep that clear. Keep your teeth on the outside and get a good seal like this with your filter. So you can breathe clearly and effectively through that. That's really important for our test. Now this test, the slow vital capacity test, is actually quite simple to do. What we're going to do is just have the patient just breathe nice and gently. All right? Now that's really important so we establish their FRC, their functional residual capacity. But just tell the patient they need to breathe nice and easily. All right? And then when they're ready, you'll coach them. They can take a big breath in, big, 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 as big as they possibly can. And then just to relax, flow, and blow it out. Blow, 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 and keep blowing and keep blowing until they've got all the air out of their lungs as much as they possibly can. All right? So just keep blowing, 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 blowing until you've got all the air out and then just relax again, and to nice, normal, even, even breathing, okay? So, nice, even breathing. Big breath in as much as you possibly can. Big, 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 as much as you can, and relax now. Blow it out gently. Blow, blow, blow. Keep blowing, keep blowing, keep blowing, keep blowing. Don't stop. Keep blowing until we see an expiratory plateau or until they just can't blow any more out, and then a nice, easy breath back in again, all right? So we're going to look at this test. We're going to see how those results are. Um, on the computer so we can know if we have a good test, all right? So that's a slow vital capacity maneuver. Okay, let's try that with a patient. So we'll get them on there. Now just nice, easy breathing now. You can see here in our graphs there, we got inspiration not going up and exhalation. We're going to let them get a nice, easy breathing going on here. Show us, get a good baseline now. Okay, next breath in, we're going to take a big breath in, as big as we can. Big, 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 come on, big breath in, big, 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 big breath in, hold it, hold it, keep big breath in, and blow it out, blow it out, keep blowing, keep blowing, keep blowing, keep blowing, keep blowing it all out now, keep blowing, keep blowing, keep blowing, and now take a nice big breath in and relax. There we are, we're all done, our first slow vital capacity maneuver. Okay, when we're analyzing the slow vital capacity, we like to see this lower baseline, an upper inspiratory plateau, and a lower expiratory plateau. So you want to see those three things. And you can see how the kind of spontaneous breathing, those initial waveforms, we get about four or five breaths to establish baseline, which is FRC, and we take a full breath in and a full breath out. And that's going to help us analyze inspiratory capacities and expiratory. So when we're doing the PFTs, it's important to make sure that we do three of them. We get a good baseline in all three. We see evidence of a good inspiratory plateau and expiratory plateaus on them, and that there's no coughs or sudden changes in, in flow during the test. The patient hasn't had any um, coughing spasms or anything like that. In this one, we're probably blowing out a little faster than we needed to, and the patient could have probably blown out a little slower, but uh, these look fine. It would meet our American. So one of the last things we need to do is take a look at our three tests that we've done. We've done three complete slow vital capacity maneuvers. maneuvers. They all meet our ATS criteria. And now we're going to make sure that they're all within 150 mils of each other, or 5% of the um, FEC, or the slow vital capacity maneuver itself. So that's important that we make sure that they're all within close criteria, and we'll take the largest one. And then we're completed our slow vital capacity maneuver. We'll look at doing interpretations uh, and things like that with this once we get in the classroom. Thank you very much.